Hey, I'm Matt and welcome to Soil Lab. We had a lot of questions recently about just how nutrient rich or how nutrient dense the output is from some of these countertop composters or food recyclers, waste reducers, whatever it is you might want to call them. So we bought the Lomi 2, ran 20 full loads through it with various inputs, and then we tested that output for nutrient density, as well as adding it to some soil with and without fertilizer. Of course, comparing that against an untreated control, as well as a fertilizer only treatment. Follow along if you'd like to learn more and dive into the data. Well, one of the first questions that might come up is just what did we put into this thing? What were our inputs? And really, we just used our regular, quote, waste stream from our kitchen. Um, so most of what's in there is going to be peppers, tomatoes, onions, cucumbers. Uh, these are all trimmings as well as some that may have spoiled. I'm also a big coffee drinker, so you're also going to notice that I added coffee as well as coffee filters and in fact full plants, both tomatoes and lettuce from prior trials here uh, at, the, at the lab. So that's what went in. What came out is here and you can see it's pretty finely ground. Um, there's still some evidence of some onion skins and some other things. You can definitely see a little bit of that filter paper, uh, but this machine did a great job job at drying and grinding that down and kicking this out. In terms of what mode we used, and I know that this varies by brand, we only used the grow mode, which is the longest mode. So it took somewhere between eight and 17 hours per cycle, depending on the moisture and how heavy that input load was. Always a full load. And then we did use the Lomi pods with every batch as well, with 50 milliliters of added water as we were directed. So we did that every single time, although our inputs did vary slightly batch to batch. So that's what I'd like to look at next, is what nutrients were available just in that raw product and what is the pH of that raw product? We tested several of these batches using the MySoil platform. So let's go ahead, dive into the data, and then we'll talk about the grow out that you see in front of me. So the soil test that we're looking at now is of that straight loamy byproduct that you're seeing um, in front of me. So a few notable things. Um, I guess I'll just work left to right. We had quite a bit of available nitrogen and that was available as both ammonium and nitrate and totaled right at 121 parts per million. So quite a bit of nitrogen in that, uh, that loamy byproduct. We see the same thing with our phosphorus. That phosphorus was sitting right at about 34 parts per million. Now the number that really kind of excited me, shocked me, I don't know the right term to use there, uh, interested me was our potassium number. And you can see this potassium number is literally um, off the chart at 624 parts per million. Now that is high, does that cause any concern? It really doesn't cause any concern for me, um, but maybe the why behind it. If you're curious about the why behind it, that's because that potassium doesn't actually get combined into an organic compound in the tissue, and it likely just leached out of that tissue um, as it went through the countertop process. So a lot of that potassium leached out, making it available for plant uptake. So none of our plants should suffer for potassium if that loamy was added. Now, the other thing that I think is notable here is the pH. Um, this definitely could be a product of the inputs that we used, like a lot of tomatoes as an example, but we had a pretty low pH, definitely suboptimal, sitting right at 5.05. Um, so definitely a low pH. Um, but remember, we're not planting straight into that loamy. We're mixing that loamy, one part loamy to 10 parts all-purpose garden soil. So we'll see how that works when it's kind of diluted uh, with a garden soil you can see that the suite of micronutrients are also relatively low and our calcium was relatively low as well. But I think when we dive in and look at the mixes and how those tested out, that's really gonna be a better look at what our plants are realizing. All right, so I mentioned that little bit of variability between batches in the Lomi. So I just pulled a handful out of the 20 batches that we ran just to take a look at. Um, on the far left, uh, you can see that's just Lomi tomato tissue. So that was about a dozen fully mature uh, tomato plants that I just broke down and put in there versus um, a kind of a typical kitchen waste here in the middle uh, versus um, just straight lettuce in the far right. Now I'm not gonna get into each nutrient, but the point here really is that we saw differences batch to batch 
what we added to uh, our containers was a mixture of all these and those are the results that you saw before and that are here. So if you're interested in learning more about the differences batch to batch, go ahead and hit pause, take a screenshot uh, and evaluate that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at our all natural garden soil, which um, is in these two treatments versus our all natural garden soil plus loamy, which is in these two treatments. On the left is our all natural garden soil, just as it was straight out of the bag. And you can see it was exceptionally low in nitrogen. I think that was right about 1.2 uh, parts per million. So really no recognizable nitrogen for our plants. And you can see our, our plant growth pretty well reflects that. Um, you can see there's decent phosphorus, potassium. We're really good across most of our macronutrients, except our magnesium is pretty low and that calcium is starting to get a little low as well. Um, but really, you can see that when we add the loamy, we get increases in all categories. So increase in nitrogen was quite significant when we added that again, one part loamy to 10 parts uh, garden soil. We saw increases in phosphorus. As we mentioned, the potassium was off the charts. It was high in this as well. All of our other macronutrients saw increases as well. I think really notably is that that magnesium went from deficient to sufficient when we added that into this all-purpose garden soil. We did still see a pretty low pH as compared to that all-purpose garden soil, but it's really starting to get closer to that uh, sufficiency range. A little bit of lime would go a long ways uh, in this mixture. So what are the treatments that we're looking at here in front of me exactly? And what were some of my takeaways like throughout this, this grow out? So first, this is straight all-purpose garden soil, straight from the big box store and straight into uh, this container. Now, one thing that you probably are recognizing is there was very, very little to no growth. Uh, both our tomatoes as well as our lettuce did germinate and emerge. Um, the tomatoes never made a true leaf, um, just the cotyledons, and those are now starting to shed here right at about eight weeks after planting. Um, our lettuce germinated, emerged, and made one true leaf uh, each, uh, and then just stunted and stalled out for the rest of the grow out. This next treatment right here is that same all-purpose garden soil, no loamy additions, and it got a 1200 feather meal at planting, as well as a micronutrient package. We bo you applied both of those at high label rates and have not fertilized since. This clearly would have benefited from a mid-season top dress application at about week four or five, um, but we didn't do that to any of the other treatments, so we just let this ride. Now, early during the experiment, this treatment actually looked the best. It came out of the ground the fastest, um, got that boost. But then about week three and four, it really started to slow down. Now, why is that? I believe that that's because this high carbon to nitrogen, this very woody all-purpose garden soil started needing, uh, the microorganisms started needing a lot of that nitrogen as well. And those microorganisms were using that nitrogen to break down that woody material, making it unavailable to our plants. Now that's termed a nitrate depression and I do believe that's what we're seeing here and why we have relatively poor plant health. Now in this treatment this was only the loamy addition so one part loamy to those 10 parts of the all-purpose garden soil. This started off days one through three with kind of this fungal mass across the top as some of that loamy byproduct was breaking down. It started off very slow in growth, but as that loamy byproduct started to break down, just like any other organic addition likely would have done that's that high in nitrogen, it started to slowly release and match that plant demand. And this has just had kind of a low, slow growth spurt. Um, and you can see plant quality here is uh, still looking pretty good. Now, what happens when we use the loamy at one to 10, plus that same fertilizer application here? You can see we have exceptional plant growth. We have really good stem diameter, more flowering than we got in our other treatments, um, and pretty robust lettuce. Now, this is just starting to outgrow this pot um, and, is, and is putting pretty high demands on there. So we're starting to see that plant quality start to reduce. Again, I think that's more of a function of our container size than anything. 
All right, so what I'd like to do now is just a quick summary of the grow out and then talk about kind of what I perceive to be the best use for something like this. So in our all purpose garden soil with only fertilizer additions um, or no additions, we really could have benefited from multiple fertilizer additions throughout the season. Now that's gonna be true for any high carbon, low nitrogen or woody, um, potting mix uh, that you use. And we see the results when we don't do that. Now, if you do add that loamy or something similar byproduct at a one to 10 ratio, I think this is what you could expect. This is certainly what we saw um, time and time again. Um, but do know that in each of these treatments, there was that fungal mass or that fungal growth for a few days as some of that byproduct started to actually compost and break down and interact with our soil microbiology. So, what am I going to use this for? What do I think this is a, a well used for? Well, I think it did work as a nice addition to our raised beds, but 20 loads was a lot. And so would I be using this for raised beds as a base? No, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably rely on a larger scale composting system of some sort, but I absolutely would use this and save it over a couple of months to start building out containers. Maybe that's for an herb garden or a balcony container garden that you might have. I think it'd be great for that. Um, ultimately, I think it's really good just to reduce the volume of your waste. And then maybe you could even just top dress some plants with this. It was a really low odor um, byproduct. I never had a foul smell, only the smell of those foods as they were breaking down. And I did catch that smell even through uh, the charcoal, charcoal filtration. Um, another use I could see for this, if you don't have a lot of volume, but you're vermicomposting as well, is this would be a great food stuff for that vermicompost bin that you're keep keeping under the kitchen sink. Um, basically, when I followed the directions and went one to 10, I was really pleased with the results. Please drop a comment below if you're using this or some other brand or something similar. I'd love to hear about your successes and your challenges as well. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, hit that notification bell to see more content when it comes available. And as always, thank you, and I'll look forward to seeing you again soon in the lab.